I'm Kevin Mangum. Uh, I have the privilege to, uh, to be the moderator with this august panel of aviation heroes, both Army and Marine Corps. And today's topic, it rolls off the tongue, future vertical lift, integral to large-scale combat operations. Or, if we want to make it an acronym, FVL and LISCO, integral and LISCO. So, again, rolls off the tongue. What I'll do quickly is introduce the panel and talk a little bit kind of frame what they're going to talk about. Uh, they'll give some opening comments on that theme, and then we'll uh, field questions. So our panel, uh, again, a very distinguished and august group of uh, aviation heroes. And I'm going to do it in order and the order in which they're going to speak. So er I think everybody here uh, knows most of these people, but uh, certainly the aviators on this panel, and I'll introduce all of them. So, Major General uh, Wally Rugen, the director of the F Future Vertical Lift cross-functional team. And General Rugen's going to focus on technologies and capabilities that really make this a transformational, uh, transfer transformational capability for, for the Army in future operations. And Major General Mac McCurry, the commander of the U.S. Army Aviation Center of Excellence and Fort Novacel. Uh, MAC is going to focus on uh, some of the Dotland PF considerations of fielding future vertical lift, as well as uh, the, the impact that that will have on warfighting concepts and doctrine. And then Eagle Six, uh, Major General J.P. McGee, commander of the 101st, he's going to describe uh, how he sees the transformational capability with increased range, speed, maneuverability, lethality, and convergence, how that might have an impact on fighting uh, the 101st in the future as Air Assault Division. And most of y'all, if you were in the sessions today, heard that General McGee is just back from Europe where his headquarters was in Romania and, and his TAC was in Poland. So he's bringing some fairly fresh observations from the UCOM uh, area responsibility. And, and our joint uh, aviator on the panel today, it's uh, Lieutenant General retired Steve Stick Rudder, U.S. Marine Corps, uh, a, a, a great friend to, uh, to many of us for our partnership and teamwork with the Marine Corps over the years. Uh, General Rudder's last job was as the uh, commander of U.S. Marine Corps Forces Pacific. So he'll talk to us a little bit today about uh, how he foresees future vertical lift, uh, complementing or changing the way the Marine Corps may fight in the future as well as uh, Indo-PACOM flavor. The other thing to, to add is that uh, General Rudder is going to lead a delegation of U.S. companies to Taiwan next week. So he's going back into th to theater next week. So with that, I will, uh, I will pass the controls to uh, General Rugen. Sir, you have the controls. Thanks, sir. Thanks for uh, posting this. Um, I'll try not to commit any fratricide uh, and stick with the technology side, but it really starts with uh, our advanced rotorcraft configurations. Again, these hybrid configurations give us the speed and range we need for our pacing threats. It generates uh, truly the strategic, operational, and tactical standoff we need at different phases of MDO uh, to do what we need to do. Um, and so again, we're going to be able to get into theater on the strategic side. We're going to be able to see and strike from an operational uh, distances, and then obviously at the tactical edge. I'll talk in a, in a minute about how we're generating freedom of maneuver, standoff, and overmatch. I think the next technology uh, concept I would speak to is, is MOSA, or our Modular Open System Approach. Um, again, this enables, when we put it on any of our air vehicles, be they the crewed vehicles or the uncrewed, uh, the ability to get the uh, systems uh, on and off our aircraft at the pace of uh, battle, and so we're turning inside our enemy, and I'll also speak to that here in a minute. So once we have a MOSA enabled advanced rotorcraft and a MOSA enabled uh, uncrewed system, uh, what we see flow through then is this notion of how do we conduct the deep sense uh, that the Secretary has, has charged uh, the Army to do. And really with uh, FARA, 
we're able to have that as the uh, stand-in sensor, but then with our launched effects, uh, be able to see deep from the lower tier of the air domain, which where there's much more uh, freedom of maneuver, and uh, again, find our pacing uh, threats and high payoff targets that we can uh, see and then uh, strike. I think also MOSA will enable a mission command uh, so when we do have degraded and denied environments, we can port on and off waveforms that are survivable in those degraded and denied environments so we can, we can talk. We always want to outsource our lethality uh, and so that ability to call back to our uh, long range fires uh, war fighting function is, is critical. And we're working at that uh, day and night to really get after Indo-PACOM uh, distances. So the reach um, in the strategic, operational, and tactical is not just in the physical uh, lower tier of the air domain, but it's also in the uh, RF domain. When we speak to uh, the ability for MOSA to then port on an ability to electronically sense, electronically protect, and electronically attack those non-lethal effects, uh, we're seeing, again, too good effect. And I would highlight, you know, the, the north of 60 technologies reported on and off the Gray Eagle without having to go back to the OEM and uh, pay high prices or pay high uh, cost and time. And we're getting those technologies uh, on and off. And then the last is really our ability to do launched effects or a lethal munition to finish. Our modular effects launcher is some great work done by a small company uh, called Fulcrum run by our great PEO Missiles in Space. Um, that MEL is porting on uh, because it's a government-defined interface and standard with software and hard points, a host of effects, um, and we've even had a cooperative engagement between an electronic warfare pod and a lethal munition. But it's that ability for a commander to tailor on their combat platform the ability to, uh, how they see the fight, uh, tailor that aircraft or that uh, uncrewed system or in, in many cases even a ground combat system because this open system approach is really um, flowing our ability to then uh, find fix and then finish and I'll uh, stop there Mac and throw it to you. Awesome. Thanks Wally. Uh, hey everybody I talked a lot this morning so uh, I'll probably go pretty short here on the opening but uh, good to see everybody. See a lot of cab commanders down here on the right side, so they're the guys out there actually making this happen every day. Um, you know, we talked earlier about, uh, you know, uh, General Rugen envisions the material and, and Rob Berry brings it to fruition, and, and you know, I have the uh, pleasure and honor of doing all the rest of the dot mill PFP wraparound that goes along with the material. And so, you know, just to focus on a couple, um, when we look at the doctrine, we're, we're churning out a new, uh, new version of the aviation doctrine. It's going to be done this, this fall, right, Eric Pulls, who's somewhere here. In the, there he is. Yeah, by September. Um, it's going to be done. But when we look at that, you know, we, we, we look at a couple things, and, and you say, What's, what remains the same and what has changed? Uh, and, and you kind of got to go to, well, what's your reference point? So if you look way back before COIN and you say we had a lot of manned scout aircraft using Mark I eyeballs, and, and, and then we kind of got in this, this fight for the last 20 years, and we did a lot of uh, looking at things, staring at things persistently with unmanned assets, and so then you look at LISCO and you say, which parts apply? And I would say all of it. And so what we're looking at is a balance of manned and unmanned human machine teaming to do reconnaissance, and that's what the FARA ecosystem brings to us. The ability to, to have that, that manned reconnaissance, that part that's integral to ground maneuver, uh, and then still be able to take advantage of the unmanned systems where we want to. You know, um, training is a really interesting one to think about with the recent down select for FLARA. So, uh, first time we've had a tilt rotor aircraft in the Army, not the first time we've had tilt rotor aircraft in the department. So we're doing a lot to lean on our, our, our brothers in, uh, in the Marine Corps and the Air Force right now on, on how to get after that. And then we'll adapt that to how Army aviators fly, you know, how we get to the X and put soldiers there and, and those kinds of things. And so we'll take a look at that. Um, I think that we also have to consider the implications of individual training qualification 
and how do you train collectively with this new capability? So in the past, you know, when we brought the H64 into being, we had, uh, you know, a collective training opportunity and ability to, to bring those units together before they joined their parent divisions, and we're looking at, at exploring some of those things. You know, a lot of people talk about facilities for Flora. Uh, we have a really good assessment on facilities, and I'm fairly comfortable about where we stand with, with the structures that we have today. Uh, we still do have to deal with some of the, the, you know, obsolescence and quality on some of the structures, and I'm sure JP would agree with that. Uh, but the, uh, but, but where we, when we talk about size and form fit, uh, for this, I'm fairly comfortable. Uh, with that, I'll, I'll wait for the questions and I'll turn it over to General McGee. Okay, well, first off, first off, thanks for uh, the opportunity to come here and uh, speak. I do recognize that uh, amongst the, uh, with the five of us, I'm the only uh, infantry officer that's, uh, that's up here, so I hope you guys don't feel outnumbered. Um, <laughs> But uh, so applicability of, of FVL and large scale combat operations. I mean, I think there is no better example of seeing the criticality of that than to watch the way the Russian uh, campaign is, is progressing right now in the Ukraine. They are, they only have one option. They can only fight in the ground. They can only fight a grinding war of attrition. They cannot fight a war of maneuver. They don't have the agility or the, uh, the capabilities to actually put their enemy on the horns of multiple dilemma. And I think that's the essence of what the FVL is going to be able to help us deliver to the Army in terms of increased uh, you know, range, speed, lethality, endurance, all of these things. And I think when it comes into the force, it's going to be coming specifically to the 101st, which I can speak about, at a unique time. Because I think all of us know for the last 20 years, you know, maybe let's say from about 2001 to about 2018, we really have been focused on these overseas contingency operations in Afghanistan and Iraq, because that's what the nation needed us to focus on. But what we're seeing now is as we start focusing on large-scale combat operations, we've had to do a bunch of fundamental skills redevelopment, because many of those things hadn't done. How do you run a heavy uh, landing zone? How do you, or pickup zone? How do you land a, a light one? How do you do massed air assaults? And we've been working very hard to work those skills and others. And so as this new capability comes on, I think we'll be at a position in terms of our trainingness, training levels, to be able to uh, incorporate them. And I just think one of the you know, initial challenges coming in, and I'd sort of say there too, is from the training and the operational pieces, how do you bring in dissimilar assets that have greatly different capabilities? I think that's gonna be one of the challenges. How do you integrate Chinooks and Blackhawks you know, with the future vertical lift? I think that's one. And then the other piece, and I think this needs to be a prime consideration for any of our air assault operations, and one, that I don't think, at least, I'm fully comfortable with the answer is or our solutions to it, is how do we do that in a way to assure maximum survivability? Not complete survivability, because in LISCO that's probably not a realistic expectation, but how do we train and then we're ready to set the conditions so that the uh, you know, application and the employment of a vertical lift, of a vertical envelopment is, is not gonna be catastrophic. I think those are some of the challenges we're gonna have as we go forward, and sir, I think, of the, you know, we had a little experience at Europe, I think, maybe later can answer some questions and talk about how that has helped shape some of the things I've seen. So with that, I'll turn it over to, uh, to General Rutter. Well, thanks uh, for having me here, Kevin, and great introduction. And, in, and it's good to have uh, some battle buddies up here, especially with those like General Rugen, where we had an opportunity to go to Congress uh, and testify together on some pretty testy issues. So second only to combat uh, when you walk into the halls of our beloved Congress who help us out so much, but, but, but thanks for having me here. For, for very quickly for the Marine Corps, having uh, done aviation programs as well as uh, Command in the Pacific, really for, for all of us here for industry, the challenge is speed, range, and network. Uh, and be able to move at pace, move at speed. And when we talk about, you know, we, we're very comfortable talking about the last tactical mile, but really in areas uh, where the Asia Pacific is the last tactical 1,000 mile. And one thing we learned when we got the V-22 and we started operating with CH-53s and H-1s is it was so capable that we were outrunning our ability to think about uh, when uh, our beloved infantry uh, were inserted onto the X in far-reaching places at range and the type of communications, the type of logistics, and type of sustainment they were going to require uh, uh, to, to do that. So, um, we, we really had to rethink that, and I think it'd be really, it's really going to be exciting to see you get a tilt rotor because in the Asia Pacific, you know, Charlie Flynn and I joined the hip 
uh, ground combat operations, uh, insert long range operations at, at scale, uh, ladies and gentlemen, is alive at well. And uh, the Pentagon will talk about air uh, and sea battle um, as a pacing factor out there, but unless you own the land, uh, you will not own the day. And especially in defense of our allies and some of our partner, partners um, uh, that we have out there. So for the United States Marine Corps, we have really three lines of effort. One is logistics. And everybody, I think, will agree wholeheartedly on that challenge. Uh, and when we talk about C-17s, they're not making anymore. We talk about C-130s, that line's coming to a close. We're talking about V-22, that line's take, talk, uh, coming to a close. So when we talk about delivery of large end items like JLTVs, 777 artillery pieces, uh, we've, got to, we've got to think about how this delivery is. And again, C-17s are probably not going inside some of the arcs uh, in some of the airfields that we may think they will go into. So logistics, the unmanned portions of FVL, uh, we've got several, and many of you companies out there are working uh, on uh, unmanned uh, vertical lift capabilities from either 100 miles to 350 miles, like the, we're, we're beginning to think about, uh, but also the larger end items, future vertical lift uh, for, for us, the 53K, and then whatever else comes after, Cape Set 4, Cape Set 4.5, Cape Set 5, what that delivery means as we look into the future. And then for us, uh, have been connected to the FVL program for quite some time with, with uh, Jim, is really, you know, um, you know, what does replace our Cobra and Huey, right? Uh, I think we're watching that as, as whether it's the V-280 or it's FARA or it's something in there. This attack strike uh, is something that will be very interesting. And my sense is it will be a manned, unmanned capability where you're gonna have loyal wingmans out there. For you, the MQ-1, and the capability that you're developing with the MQ-1 is gonna be tremendous to stay connected as it is right now for all of your future vertical lift assets. And then the final is assault support, and we talked about the delivery. Delivery of our, uh, our assault force uh, to seize and hold, defend terrain in these particular areas. That'll be interesting to see how that all plays out. For us, again, V-22, somehow we've gotta get that out to 2055 uh, uh, with the upgrades program. We're buying CH-53K, we've got KC-130s, but again, if you think about those programs, uh, that assault support piece as we look out into the future as our third line of effort will be uh, very interesting to see which way we break, because we still have to, one, put an assault force in, and again, back to the greatest challenge that we have, and that's logistic sustainment. In soldiers and Marines, uh, no matter what you say, they're gonna have three DOS, three days of supply ammunition. They will go through that quicker than our planners can ever imagine. So we've gotta make sure we have a way to replenish them with not only the high-end weapon systems like PRISM in the future, uh, but also the ammunition for the, the, the standard uh, infantry uh, brigades. Thank you, appreciate it. Thanks, Steve. Uh, so, the, uh, we're gonna take questions, and there's a microphone here on the front row. So as people are kind of putting their questions together, raise your hand or stand up, and uh, Walt, here's the first, first gentleman right here, uh, raise his hand. And, So is this muted? Apparently not. But it does have feedback. Hi, Warren Elworth, concerned citizen. Um, if, if I could, two questions, one for each type of aircraft, one for future long-range assault aircraft, and one for future attack reconnaissance aircraft. On the FLARA, um, when they get dot mil PF and facilities, everyone's automatically thinking hangars. Um, what I'll do is ask the two questions, sit down, and then you guys can formulate your response. Um, so if it's going to go fly far and fast on purpose, raison d'etre, then uh, there's a national speed limit below 10,000 feet at 250 knots. I think there's a reason they call it the V280. So how are we going to do multi-ship, um, long, fast flying is a dot mil PF question. On the FARA, you know, got it, sir. Shoot somebody else's bullets first, 100%. Um, some of those amazing weapons go up to airliner altitudes. That takes more than a second to clear the airspace. 
then you've got the time of flight. Meanwhile, you've upset somebody who's taking an exception with your, your presence, they're going to shoot back at you. So you've got a long time to get off-board effects. On-board effects, all the missiles have a minimum range. And that donut hole is getting bigger, not smaller. So if you're, so we'll compare Jagim min range, actual, compared to like Hellfire min range. But the point is, if you're, if you're fighting for information in complex airspace, like combat, ba complex battle space, like urban, where the threats can pop up from any direction, and you might want to evade and shoot back at the same time, um, how can you do that without a flex gun? Thanks. No, I think, uh, you know, good questions. I think, I think you are hearkening back to uh, kind of current fleet technology. And, and so, um, you know, it, it's hard to uh, conflate those in, in the uh, engagements that we are talking about uh, as we do the penetration. So at penetration, we're obviously talking unclass uh, greater than uh, 32 kilometers. And again, we've run um, hundreds of hours of experiments out on our Western test ranges, backed up by uh, nearly 300,000 engineer runs in high fidelity physics-based models on that penetration phase that brings us from 32 into uh, a closer uh, fight. Um, the flex gun has not been uh, eliminated at all. Uh, from the fight, um, but I would say probably one of the, the closest knife fighters we have currently is the DAP, and it doesn't have a flex gun, and it, uh, it rocks and rolls. Uh, so, you know, what we're really trying to do um, is give commanders options, and as uh, Jerome McGee said, set the conditions, right? So we have to be mindful of our strengths and limits. Army Aviation isn't going to do it all. It's going to go as a team. It's going to go as a joint combined arms team. And, and so you're right. There are limits to everything. Some of these high-end uh, uh, joint munitions do take a long time to get there. Uh, and so what do we provide? Well, we provide, if you do have a fleeting target, an immediate attack uh, at you know different dis transformational differences than what we've done in the past, 32 kilometers versus eight. Or in your case, if you want to neck it down to what is the max effective range of a Hellfire, is it less than eight? Arguable, right? So I, I think we are working through that. Um, you know, we're not the golden BB that's going to, uh, you know, go through and, and, and whack everything. But I, I'm very confident in our um, Western test range work. Much of it is classified. And the concepts are working very, very well. Um, and I'm happy to report that out against live threats on the field with operators who know we're coming. Yeah, yeah, I, I, and again, that's all about condition setting, so I would say that that is not part of the penetration phase, that's part of the exploitation phase, and when we do start to exploit as an Army aviation team, how we generate that frame of maneuver is very much on the crews and the commanders, and we've given them tools to do that. Um, we do have a flex gun that's going to suppress. We do keep the rockets that's going to suppress. Uh, and then obviously we have uh, the Hellfire and Jagum that are going to be tank killers or armored vehicle killers um, in mass. Got me, got me turned on? Okay, good. Hey, so uh, the question about, I think, airspace and training airspace. So we've been all over the country, out on the western test ranges, uh, Orchard Training Area out in Idaho, uh, Nellis, NTC, uh, Wismer, looking at how do we then do collective level training at the speeds we're talking about. So acknowledge the, acknowledge the floor. Um, I think we have some ways to do that. Uh, you know the high end of, uh, of flora is just above those speeds, so maybe when you're when you're in the the controlled airspace, you're doing that kind of thing. Um, I think also though, just this this is the uh, this is my challenge with you know the massive spreadsheet of dot mil PFP. We just did a down select, and we're and we're starting to look at training, and this is one of the things we'll have to tick off a, as we do that. Uh, 
but just because there's restrictions doesn't mean we don't need the capability. So we have to work through the restrictions to do the training. Our adversaries don't really care that we have restrictions on that, they, but we still need the capability to get there, get there fast, increase survivability through the speed and reach, uh, and put soldiers in the position of relative advantage that they need to be put in. So we acknowledge the challenge with, with some of the national airspace, uh, and we'll be working through it during the DOTML PFP analysis. I'll say one thing about the, the training space. We, we really struggle with that uh, with our F-35 program. Both we, the Navy, and the Air Force. The good news is you have a very capable airplane, longer range weapon systems, and you can spread yourselves out in miles uh, and do air to air or air to ground engagements. The challenging piece is our airspace ranges, you, we just can't contain ourselves. Like for the Marine Corps, I mean, 29 Palms, where you had the LA LAX airspace going over the top of that, we struggle to stay inside that postage stamp. We struggle in other areas when, uh, with our V-22s to do 10,000, 12,000, 13,000 foot penetration for an assault support mission for, a, for an insert, and you've got you've to have that airspace cleared out. So for those of us who work at Dotland PFF, it's a constant battle on one, range encroachment so we don't lose any more airspace, but two, when able, look for opportunities to expand that, that uh, range space so that one, our long range weapon systems can be employed and used uh, in, in concert with maneuvering ground forces. Uh, but no doubt, that is a full time job for, for, the, for the, the men and women doing DOTMO PF and the bases and stations who have to integrate with the FAA or the, or the local community for, for range expansion and or just keeping the space that you have. While we're uh Looking across the crowd for other questions, uh, General McGee, if you would just expand on your comments about observations in UCOM AOR and the and the applicability of future vertical lift and those. Certainly. So we just came back from doing a nine-month deployment, being the uh, division headquarters in Southeast Europe. So our area of responsibility incorporated Slovakia, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria. Uh, three of those countries have a significant border with, uh, with uh, Ukraine and are obviously very concerned about the, the Russian threat and the conflict that's going on in there. Uh, I think if you take a look at how you would have to defend those countries, which we spent a lot of time working, I mean, maneuverability, adaptability over that terrain would be absolutely critical. And so there's a lot of discussion about how, I mean, you would imagine the first phase of that operation would be by their nature defensive where we'd be defending our NATO allies from a Russian incursion if that ever, if that ever occurred. You could certainly see how something that give you increased range, speed, lethality would be tremendously important in terms of maneuvering forces to block and thwart and attack into that country. Because some of that terrain is, uh, it was really sort of mixed in the area that we operate. Some of it was very mountainous, very compartmented, very difficult for formations to move through. Some of it was wide open, sort of ta uh, you know, stereotypical tank country. But you could see how this increased speed, range, lethality would really be an advantage to get you at a position advantage where you could stop attacks, you could hold critical infrastructure, you could seize uh, you know, crossroads or towns ahead of any sort of known enemy threat. The other piece that we worked while we were there is we started running some notional uh, war games and drills on how would you actually defend a coastline. Okay? It's been a long time since the Army's had to defense a co defend a coastline. I think it was World War II. And again, those sort of qualities, agility, the ability to maneuver quickly to be able to actually respond to the enemy's attack and then be able to maneuver your forces to a position of advantage, all are you know, really critical in the European theater where we can probably expect to fight in some ways outnumbered and still expect to, uh, to win. And I think these things all, you know, the future vertical lift just enhances our ability to be able to, uh, to conduct operations like that. General Rudder, if you, I know we've talked a little bit about the challenges, of lift challenges in the Pacific and the deficit uh, there. If you could, how would future vertical lift help mitigate some of that uh, that lift deficit and risk? Yeah, I'll, I'll you know, I'll foot stomp the. There ain't enough lift in the Pacific, whether it's watercraft or aviation, and the more the mo more is better, right? As a, I'll, I'll offer a couple things too for, ver for future vertical lift in the manned area that we learned the hard way with the V-22. I'll just name off a couple things. All of you are, especially our industry partners and those of you who are 
or flying airplanes uh, would recognize some of these things. First is, uh, you know, gas, gas, gas. You got to have fuel. Fuel is life. Um, uh, in air refueling probes have been a savior for us. Now the question is, do you have enough tankers? So as you begin to look at, especially in the special ops community where you have op you know, options to get those tankers, I think it's uh, well worth as you begin to explore refueling options for this airplane to make sure we got enough gas out there, whether it's on the ground, in the air. Secondly is uh, you are going to be, with the V-20 anyway, you're going to be flying as a fixed wing pilot. You're going to be flying at altitude. And what we did is we brought in F-18 pilots and KC-130 pilots to teach us how to fly that airplane. Because we were flying it like a helicopter for a very long time. I mean, helicopter course rolls in North Carolina. And um, we began to explore and getting people up at altitude and flying. It's a different world. Link 16, over the horizon comm. If you're at Asia Pacific, if you're not on the link out there, if you can't pass a J-series code, you ain't getting into the fight. I mean, it's just the way it is. You gotta be able to be in the fight. Um, for over the horizon comms, we didn't put over the horizon comms in the V-22. So there's reporting points out there if you're flying on altitude where you have to report in through, through, through through uh, several of your partner countries, which we have to have a cha we had to have a chase airplane actually do the reporting for us because we didn't have all the rising comp. Very very important. And then uh, we learned the hard way that you kind of need a weather radar because when you're at altitude and that weather's out in front of you, you got to have something or you're going to fly. And you know uh, you know being the recipient of a few lightning strikes over the years flying in altitude in the weather out there, uh, it took us a lot to be able to do that. And not to mention oxygen and. You know, we, we don't have oxygen in the back of the V-22 for our assault force, so it's not pressurized. Uh, Special Ops is a roll-on, roll-off one that they use. We don't, so we're limited with an assault force at the 13,500, 14,000 feet. If not, you put them to sleep for a little bit. We don't like that. And, and then they wake up before the insert, is <laughs> my understanding anyway, yeah. But a lot of these things, I think, will come to fruition, and I, I say that in relation to those things in the Pacific. A lot of range, long range, and when you're flying uh, a fixed-wing airplane, you'll be part of a package. You may have growlers, Navy growlers jamming for you. You're going to have your MQ-1s, MQ-9s out there jamming for you, providing you that data, that data link information. It really, you become a larger part of this package uh, with the joint force, I think. And let me tell you, uh, to get to where uh, to get to where our, uh, our ground forces need to go, your, our standoff, our distributed operation requirements are increasing, not decreasing. So when I mentioned earlier, 1, 000, the final 1,000 tactical, 1,000 mile tactical, that's the tactical you know, closure rate. We're not, I'm not too far off that in some cases where Okinawa to, to mid, Midway Philippines, 800 miles. Philippines is 1,000 miles from, from tip to, to toe, and it's 300 and some odd miles, you know, just from Okinawa down to Yanaguni, which is just off the coast of Taiwan. And I won't talk about Taiwan, so that's another story for another, for another, for another uh, conference. But uh, I think all these things uh, you will learn, and personally, because the last thing I'm going to say here is I'm excited to see you guys bring this, this capability online, and being an old TAC helicopter guy, yes, I'm still a big flex fan, flex gunning fan, but you know we'll have other things to do that as well. But uh, thank you again uh, for listening and appreciate it, Kevin. Th thanks very much. And you know, as General Rudder points out, that the distances that uh, that are in play, uh, the network is going to become no, more important. So I'd, li I'd like to ask uh, General Rugen to talk about how future vertical lift will enable the network, and how the network will enable future vertical lift. And you're, you're up next. Okay, so uh, when it comes to network, obviously we've been uh, working very hard in our modeling uh, and also uh, in a D-deal environment out west to understand the survivability of our networks and waveforms. So um, it starts with a lot of bureaucratic uh, work to get these things called an interim authority to test. Um, and kind of a humble brag for, for my team. Um, last project convergence, we had 25 interim authorities to test. Uh, and I think the entire exercise, which included a coalition and the entire joint force only had about 120. So we are doing the hard work to get 
uh, this network concept in and get it tested and make sure it's viable. Uh, a couple of the concepts that we've seen work very well is uh, our, our solar powered high endurance glider uh, that, that again can bring forward effectively a retrans capability. And this retrans capability is hosted on a platform that's uh, fairly attributable but flies so slow that frankly it's probably pretty hard to hit. Um, what we've ported on to this, um, this uh, Krauss aircraft is, is a MAN-A waveform, which is mesh networks that we uh, pipe down to uh, the ground force uh, at the tactical edge. We've converted a lot of those MAN-A wa waveforms as they send data for the common operating picture into our data links uh, and then back to the unit of action, which typically has been kind of a JTF or division level structure. We're doing that right now with the Rakasans out west at Yuma Proving Ground, Joint Base Lewis McCord, and Fort Wainwright, Alaska, where they're uh, flying about eight waveforms. So this notion of uh, long haul uh, or over the horizon comms, uh, the, the most uh, favorable waveform I've seen is already an NSA approved waveform, TTNT, that the Navy's using. Um, and again, we've seen it at MDO distances uh, north of 350 miles uh, out in PACOM where we've, uh, we've talked and passed uh, our fire mission, or, you know, our, our targeting data um, and our deep sense data. I think the last thing I'll say is uh, we're bringing a network, so we are back in the retrans business uh, as a force. Um, we're hosting those waveforms and at times we're just whatever the ground force needs to bounce off or the, the joint force needs to bounce off. And to the Link 16 uh, piece, uh, heavily into Link 16 and, and working those, um, in, in this case, at, at, with a Dutch F-35 out at Yuma, this next workup. So the network is being you know, run very rigorously. And so the transition from a, uh, from a joint U.S. Joint uh, Panel, we'll turn it over to our Australian friend here for, uh, for his question. Uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, Lieutenant Colonel Trent Groves from the Australian Army. Thanks for the opportunity for you uh, listening to you this afternoon and the opportunity to ask a question. I just had a question uh, on how important it is for an ally to share the same philosophy uh, as we're going forward, particularly when we talk about uh, the Pacific Theatre. So, I heard you this morning, General, particularly talk about there's always going to be a human up there. You want to get that information from them. But some of our, one of our allies, at least earlier in the year, indicated they're going to uh, replace their attack and observation uh, aircraft with uh, uncrewed systems. So just wondering if you could share your thoughts on how important it is for an ally to share your same philosophy moving forward. Thanks for that. I, I, I think, you know, stronger together we all we always want partners and allies we're, we're ne probably never going anywhere alone so uh, i don't know that we have to have the same thing the same piece of metal doing the same task all the time but i think interoperability I is critical and, and we focused on that uh, in europe for a long time with nato as we look at the pacific and, and a lot more you know bilateral type arrangements i think that that's critical that we communicate you know uh standards that we're using and things so we we build some sort of interoperability uh with partners and allies in the region but i don't think we have to do the same you know have the same kit all the time that being that being said we you know we're always looking for partners to to work with us on future vertical lift and and uh, look forward to future discussions with the with uh, australia Okay, we just have a couple mi more minutes. Any, any other takers on questions? Come on up. Don't be bashful, come on up, man. Hi, gentlemen, uh, Wisconsin Army National Guard. My question, when we got the mic models, we don't have GPS that caused some issues going into the European theater, which obviously we rectified after the fact. I know with the open architecture, I'm assuming we're going to have the ability to modify and adjust as we get the aircraft, and we don't want this to hold us from getting the aircraft in the first place, obviously. Um, my question is not only are we getting GPS, but also 
are we going to have all the same capacity that we currently have in our current airframes, ATM tasks be very similar, and then also moving forward, are we expecting um, any additional tasks or capacity? And I think you've addressed that a little bit already. Yeah, I think on the MOSA piece, I mean, uh, to be clear, you have GPS, you just didn't have GPS for a GPS approach is how I uh, understand that. And, and that is an important distinction, but uh, you know, you should have it. And I think again, when we talk about open system approach, this notion of, um, of having a third party vendor be able to uh, bring in what you needed to deploy into theater uh, and, and do an instrument approach which would be very valuable in a, in a uh, you know, weather-filled uh, AOR like uh, UCOM. So yeah, that concept is work, working and, and has worked. I'll brag on our S&T folks from uh, AVMIC a bit, but they completed their fourth uh, capstone demo of the mission system architecture uh, design in 2020 that then fed an AROC on MOSA uh, in June of, of 20. Um, what we showed or what they showed in that S&T uh, framework was an ability for a third party to come in and bring and integrate onto an air platform uh, outside of the OEM, which is what we want. So when you need that piece of kit, uh, we can get it and we can get it at the pace of battle. We've shown that over, over and over and now that S&T program has been transitioned. It is fully instantiated in the FLARA and FARA and unmanned system uh, requirement documents and transition into the tech specs of all the RFPs. So the PEO has really operationalized that transition and to good effect. Are we perfect? I would not say that we're perfect, but on something like this GPS question, I see uh, very optimistic that that will not happen in the future platforms. Are you there? All right. Hey, I also think this, this screams why we have to modernize. We have to go clean sheet. We have a lot of platforms that we've loved for years, and, and I've flown most of them and love them. But when you continue to hang more and more federated things on an, a platform that was designed 30 years ago, instead of having an open architecture where you can rapidly plug and unplug capability, that leads you to having to modernize the fleet. Well, it looks like we're about to run out of time. I certainly want to thank uh, everybody on this panel. I, you know, it's an exciting time for Army Aviation. It's an exciting time for land forces to integrate uh, future vertical lift. And want to thank each one of these great heroes for what they have done, what they are doing, and what they will do to enable the joint force to continue to be a dominant force uh, for good across the world. So thanks everybody for coming. Thanks to each one of y'all.